Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess game. We've talked about this idea a little bit in the past, but I thought I'd dedicate an entire video to it. It's called the pointing rule. And what I've noticed over the years is that a lot of my students have heard variations on this rule, or they hear part of the rule, and then they misapply it. So it makes sense to really understand this rule much better. <clears throat> okay, let me state my version of the pointing rule. I'm sure there's others. And that is, if the E and the D pawns, all four of them are locked up against each other. The white E pawn is up against a ram with the black E pawn, and the, and the white D pawn is up against a ram with the black D pawn. And, and assuming they're, they're all touching each other, then you should be able to put your hand across your two pawns from your side of the board and it'll point to the side of the board where you should attack and the side of the board where you should play your pawn break. All right, it's, sometimes it's easier to show this than it is to try to explain the definition. So let's look at the two main openings where you see this, which are King's Indian and French. Let's start with French. E4, E6, D4, D5. Now here the main move for black, for white, is to play Knight C3. But let's say white plays the advanced variation. Why? Not because it's so good, but because we want to create the pawn structure. This is what I'm talking about. The E and the D pawns are all up against each other, and they're all blocked together. Now, we could create a crazy position. Let's, let's go back. Let's play like <clears throat> E3, E5, D4, E5, D5, D6. Now, here... <clears throat> the E and the D pawns are all blocked up against each other, but this is not a pointing rule type of position. So they all have to be contiguous like I showed in the French. So again, E4, E6, D4, D5, E5. So here the black pawns are touching each other. The white pawns are touching each other. They're up against each other. So here, if white puts his hand across the E and D pawns, it's pointing to the right to the king side. If you're sitting on the black side of the board, let's flip the board. And you point across your E and D pawns, it's pointing up to the queen side. Since it's black's move, what, what should black do here? It says black should break on the queen side and probably attack on the queen side. Why should he attack on the queen side? Because when he plays this break move, C5, which is on the queen side. This wall of pawns is creating an, a, an area back here where black can safely put his pieces behind those pawns. And therefore, the, the pieces will be relatively safe on the queen side. And since he can put his pieces there, he can create a predominance of space there and attack over there. White usually plays c3 here. Now, where's white's break move? White's break move later is to play f5. That's a much more difficult move to achieve. You do see sometimes in some of the lines here for white, white can't play this move right away, but he sometimes he plays an early f4. For instance, let's look at the Steinitz variation of the French. Knight c3, knight, at, knight f6, now e5, setting up again the central pawn idea. So, of course, black can't break yet. He has to save his knight, knight d7. And then white often plays f4 here, so that when black tries to break down the pawn structure and this d pawn gets undermined, he'll have a pawn on f4, supporting e5, and later getting ready for his break move to play f5. So e4, e5, e6, d4, d5, e5. There's the prerequisite e and d pawns. There's the pointing roll. There's our break move. Let's do this with the king's Indian. d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, king's Indian. e4, d6, bishop e2, castle. Knight f3, e5, mainline, tabia, castle. Knight c6, d5, now we've got that center set up with the E and D pawns that way, knight to E7. Notice if you, if you didn't say the E and D pawns, you could erroneously think it might be white's C and D pawns, 
which would point the exact opposite direction, and then you'd be in trouble. So you want to make sure it's always the E and D pawns. So here, white's pawns are pointing to the queen side, white's break is with C5, black pawns are break pointing to the king side, black's break is F5, therefore sometimes you see moves like knight to E1, getting ready to play knight D3 and support the break to C5, knight D7 getting out of the way of the break, and now a typical move for white is bishop e3, supporting his break. Black plays his break. White keeps his pawn structure intact. Let's say black gains space. White keeps the bishop on that diagonal with this break. And then soon after, white will play c5 here, initiating play on the queen side, while black's now going for a pawn break on g4 to open up the white king, one of the main lines of the king's Indian defense. All right, let's talk about misinterpreting the pointing rule. Let's say you don't realize the pawns all have to be up against each other. Let's say you look at a, move, a position like this, and you say, aha, there's the pawns pointing this way. Aha, there's the points pointing that way. Well, right away, you should notice there's a problem. Both sides' pawns are pointing to the queen side. Now, that doesn't mean it's never possible for both sides to play on the same side of the board. Of course it is. But generally, the pointing rule is going to point to a side of the board where you have an advantage, and it's the opposite side of the board where the pawns will be pointing to where he has the advantage. Here, because they're both pointing to the same side, it's almost like saying that white is better than black and black is better than white on the queen side. Well, both sides can't be better on the queen side. And even though both sides have break moves here, for instance, white can now play c4 like in a queen's gambit, and black later on could play c5, or even he could play it right away, and those moves are very reasonable in this position. This wouldn't be because of the pointing rule. It would be because you want to play a break move against a fixed pawn, and your break move with e5 or e4 is already difficult to achieve. So playing c4 makes a lot of sense here, but I wouldn't consider this the pointing rule at all. What, where else could you go wrong? Well, you can go wrong if you just create any pawn chain and create the pointing rule. For instance, suppose black... Black plays c5 Sicilian and white plays this crazy move h3 and black decides to play b6. Well, here black's got a pawn chain that's pointing toward the middle. Does that mean black should attack in the middle? Well, no, that doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't mean that black should never attack in the middle. Maybe attacking in the middle makes sense, but not because of the pawns pointing there. So you can't just take any old pawn chain and point it. Let's take a pawn chain where the pawns are the, the utmost on the outside. Let's say something like b4, c5, b5, knight f6, a4, knight g8. I'm just trying to create a position. a6, knight f6. And let's say white plays b6 and black plays a6. Okay, let's say we try to use the pointing roll over here. Well, which way are white's pawns pointing? White's pawns are pointing toward the center, toward the king side. Should white be attacking in the king side because of this? No, not really. Also, where are black pawns pointing? Black pawns are pointing off the board. They're pointing to the file that comes before A. So whatever letter comes before A in the alphabet, that's where you should attack. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Black can't attack to the right of the A file because there is no file to the right of the A file. So if you try to apply the pointing rule to every time pawns get locked together, it's just not going to make any sense. I'm just trying to show you all these counterexamples so you won't try to think every time you lock pawns that the pointing rule will somehow help you. So here again, white, the way white's pawns are pointing, the way black's pawns are pointing, has nothing at all to do with where they should be playing. Now, could you apply the pointing rule in, in some situations where it's not the main two center pawns? And the answer is yes, you just have to be careful. Okay, suppose you apply it with the D and the C pawns. Let's say white plays D4, black plays D5, white plays C4, black plays C6, and white plays C5. Not a good move. You don't see any grandmasters playing C5 early against the Slav defense. But let's say they didn't. Let's say you now apply the pointing rule. And you say black's pawns are pointing 
well, toward the E file and toward the king side, and white's pawns are pointing toward the queen side. Would it make sense here that white would try, that black would now try to play E5 and break that way? Let's ask Stockfish. Stockfish, what's the best couple moves here for black? Stockfish says, of course, E5 already is the best move. Now, if you're one of those people that goes, I can't play E5, he'll just take me and I'll lose a pawn. Well, that's a quiescence error because if you play E5 and play your break move and white plays D takes E5, black can immediately get his pawn back with bishop takes C5 and now white already has a weakened center with the E pawn doubled and a little bit isolated there on E5 and it's a target and black's already developed his bishop with tempo. Stockfish evaluates this position as minus 1.25 if white would do something like this. All right, what if white doesn't take? What if white just says, I'll, I'll just keep my pawn chain intact? Well, again, black says, Stockfish says, black already has the advantage. It's suggesting to guard your e-pawn now with a move like knight to d7. All right, so you say, well, Dan, you just showed me an example where the pointing rule kind of works, and it's not the e into d-pawns. Okay, well, it worked here, but it doesn't mean it always works as well as we've already seen when it's not the E and D pawns. Would white want to typically try to break here with B5? And the answer is, yeah, probably. He's got no other real good places to break. You always want to break at the base of the pawn chain. The, the C6 pawn is not the base. The base is B, B7. But if you break at the top, if let's say black plays, um, I don't know, let's make just a nothing move, knight D7 and, and white plays E4, of course, that pawn's not guarded, and black can just take it. And even if that pawn were guarded, let's say white plays knight c3, and black plays e6, and white plays e4, then when white takes and black takes, losing the top of the pawn structure doesn't weaken the rest of the pawn structure. And now white has a backward pawn on a semi-open file on the, on the, the d4 square, and black's doing okay. Stockfish here says black has a very slight advantage already when white broke on the wrong side here. So again, you know, c5 is not a very good move against the Slav. After e5, black's doing really well, but could use the pointing rule here? Yeah, you could use it a little bit. So we could modify the pointing rule and say, it always works with the e and the d pawns when they're all locked together. If you're, if you're working with a, a pawn that's one off from the e and d file, let's say the d and c file, or the F and E file, then yeah, it'll probably work. So for instance, let's do it with the E and the F file. E4, E5, F4, King's Gambit, and now let's say black plays something bad. I don't know, Bishop E7, and white says, oh, I don't wanna take the pawn, I'll play here, and black plays here, allowing queen checks. Well, does white want to attack on the king's side? Yeah, does black want to counter break in the center if he can? Well, yeah, sort of like what we just saw with that strange line in the Slav. But again, you have to be a little bit careful. Every time you move off the D and E pawns, it gets more and more tricky. And if you go further than, than that, and you started doing, let's say, the B and the C pawns, already I think it would not make a lot of sense. For instance, C4, C5, B4 break, let's say white, Black doesn't take it, he plays b6 and pawn here. Is this a break move here that you could try to play a5 and open the file? Absolutely. Is d5 a move that black could play and try to break open the center? Yep, yep. So in this particular case, working with the b and the c pawns, it does work okay, but you have to be a little careful because suppose you're interpreting where these pawns are pointing and you say the pawns are pointing to the king side, so I should attack king side. Well, that's not really the right interpretation. The pawns are pointing to the left, but the left of the B and C files isn't the king side, it's the center. So it's really sort of saying that black should play in the center. So you gotta be very careful. If you use the two center pawns, then when it points to the side, it's always pointing to the king side or the queen side, it's never pointing to the center. When you do it here with the B and the C pawns, it's not that white's pawns are necessarily pointing queen side. They're actually pointing to the A file. And it's not that black's pawns are pointing king side. They're pointing to the D file. So if you want to use it in that, in that very narrow sense, sure, 
you could attack to the left of black's pawn chain here, looking to black, and if we flip it for white side, then white's pawns are also pointing to his left, which means maybe break with the A file. Now, does that mean if I had this position for white, my whole plan would be around playing A4, A5, and breaking with the A pawn? No, it's too early in the game. I need to develop my pieces. Maybe later in the game, the center is going to become a lot more important. Maybe I'll play knight f3 and d4 and open up the center, and then playing a5, a, a4, a5 doesn't make any sense. So you got to be, again, really careful. If it's the center pawns, what you're going to do is going to be really important, and it's going to be right away. Let's go back to our King's Indian kind of formation. d4, d6, e4, e5, and white closes the center like this. See here, it's pretty, pretty important that white play for a move like c5 pretty quickly. And it's very important, even more important for black, to play for a move like f5 very quickly. But when we did that side thing with the b and the c pawns, it wasn't the be-all and end-all anymore of what you're supposed to be trying to do. So when you do it with the d and the e pawns, it really works. If you do it with the a and b pawns or the g and h pawns, it's not going to really work at all. If you do it with, with some intermediate pawns, it might help. It might be a good indicator, but it's not a really a hard and fast rule anymore. So again, you have to be very, very careful when understanding these pointing rule things. What percent of games get into pointing rules? Well, not that many. Let's, let's look at some openings and see what we can find. Uh, Roy Lopez. Well, sometimes white plays d5s in Roy Lopez's. For instance, let's look at the main line of the closed Roy Lopez. Knight f6, castle, bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, d6, c3, castle, h3, knight a5, bishop c2, c5, d4, queen c7. Let's say white plays the line knight bd2, and let's say black plays knight c6 to put pressure on this pawn. Well, there are lines here where white plays d5, okay? And black will play something like knight d8, later maybe thinking to go to f7 if the f-pawn moves. Well, here black clearly could play for this f5 break, but white has very strongly created pressure for himself there. So white is kind of playing against that f5 break a little here. What about white's break on the queen side? It would say white should play c5 and break here, but black's already got a pawn on c5. So we can see that here the pawns are locked together and we have the criteria for the pointing rule, but we have to modify our understanding of the pointing rule to, see what, to say what it's saying here. White can still play on the queen side. He has a pawn on d5 and black has a pawn on d6, so he has more space on the d file. But black has more space on the A, B, and C files. So it's true, white here could play a move like A4. In fact, Stockfish is saying A4 to play on the queen side is the best idea here. But later on, a lot of times you see white play knight F1, knight G3 to play against this F5 square again. And then white with his bishops, his Lopez bishops pointing to the king side, actually tries to attack on the king side. So if you kind of blindly applied the pointing rule to the fact that all the center pawns are locked together here, you get a little bit of an erroneous idea of what both sides are trying to do. If the black pawn were not on c5, well, that would make a little bit more sense. All right, let's try another opening. Let's try uh, Benoni. d4, knight f6, c4, c5. And now white plays d5. All right, well, one of the lines black can play here, he can play e6, but let's say he plays an old line like d6. Okay, well, again, we don't have the e and the d pawns. So we have the c and the d pawns. Can black now play to break with b5 and break it at the base? Absolutely, you would do that whether the d pawn was locked together or not. The fact that the c pawns are locked gives you that b5 break. Could black break at the center here? Yes, he could. What would happen if black plays the old Benoni? Suppose white plays knight c3 and black plays e5, and instead of taking on Passant, white plays e4. Well, okay, this is interesting. Now we've got the pawns locked together in the center, but just like in the Roy Lopez, we have this black pawn on c5, which means white can certainly not play to break on 
c5 in this position. Where's where White's breaks moves here? His break moves are f4, which again breaks at the top of the pawn chain, and b4, which again breaks at the top of the other pawn chain. Black, on the other hand, can break with b5 and f5. The, the center pawn pointing rule would tell him that f5 is the better break, but experience tells us that playing for b5 is okay here too. So white has more space here for sure. He's got pawn, two pawns on the fourth rank and one on the fifth. Black has two on the fifth and one on the sixth. Let's play a few moves by both sides and see how the engine wants to take advantage of the pawn moves and what he wants to do to, to try to give white space advantage some meaning here. So let's play the best move by the engine. I'll, I'll show you what the engine's saying. I'll move it up here. All right, so bishop to e2, bishop to e7. Now here, the engine doesn't mind blocking his kingside break move for the moment. Plays knight f3, castle. And now he's saying a3 or g3. Well, let's play, let's play a3. a3, that's getting ready for the b4 break. Rook b8, black's getting ready for his break. Queen c2, over protecting e4. a6, again preparing this break. h3, looks like a beginner's move, but the computer's a lot better than I am. Knight h5, again getting ready to break on both sides. Both sides are getting ready for break moves. White plays g3 to keep the knight out and maybe support f4. Knight d to f6, interesting move. Blocking the knight's only retreat square and blocking the break move. Bishop e3, g6. And now white plays his break b4. Black simply maintains the, the structure with b6. Rook to b1, bishop d7. And now the obvious move, king to f1. Well, we always tell you castle early and often, and here the engine's not even gonna do that. All right, so you can see that how the pawns pointed in this position did not have a lot to do with how the 3500 level engine decided where to put his pieces. So, you know, again, you have to be a little bit careful about being overly uh, enthusiastic about this. One thing, we again, we don't want you to do, and it's worth repeating, is if you do have center pawns that are not locked together, but they happen to be pointing in a direction, be very careful about over-interpreting this because this would sort of tell both sides that, oh, the queen side's where I want to go. Well, again, as we said earlier in the video, it's, it's very reasonable to play a queen side break here like c4. In fact, that's white's number one move. But this really wouldn't be because of the pointing rule again. So, and usually if the, if the pointing rule is being applied correctly, the two sides would have the pawns pointing to opposite directions, which makes sense. It would be like telling white, you're better over here, and telling black, yeah, but you're better over here, and, the, and those two here should be the opposite sides. If they're both the same side, there's something wrong. It, again, it, it's sort of like saying A is better than B and B is better than A. It doesn't make sense. So what we tried to do in today's video is we tried to tell you about the break, the, the pointing rule. We also tried to tie it into the earlier video on break moves. We tried to explain that if you, you gotta have all the pawns locked together, it's really best if they're the D and the E pawns. Does it work sometimes with pawns that are near the center but not in the center? And the answer is yes, sometimes it works if you're careful about how you interpret what the pointing rule is trying to tell you. It's not trying to necessarily tell you to attack on that side of the board, but maybe right where the chain is ending. And if you try to apply it with the pawns, remember how we did it with the A and the B pawns? Pawn here, pawn here b5, knight f6, a4, knight f6, a5, and now we could do it either way. We could have black play b6 and white play a6, and here the white pawns are pointing off the board, and of course that's not where white wants to attack. And if black plays a6 and white plays b6, is white trying to attack c7? Well, it'd be nice if I could put a knight in there or something, but that's not necessarily where I'm trying to attack. Black's pawns are pointing off the board, doesn't make any sense. You just can't apply the pointing rule in positions like this. So the further you get from the center, the less it means. It really should be restricted to applying it mostly to center pawns. 
If you do apply it to ones that are just off the center, you're probably going to be okay. Just be a little careful when you're doing that. Okay, so today we've talked about the pointing rule. And if you haven't seen the earlier video on break moves, you saw how important the pointing rule was to break moves. That's why I always say the pointing rule points to the side where you should attack and where you should break, not just the side where you should attack. Hopefully you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, you can do that. But even more importantly, tell your friends about the tent, our channel, Dan Heisman Chess. We've got, I, we've got videos on all types of improvement. A lot of the games where I think out loud are really good for learning, um, thought process stuff, time management. We've got it all. Talk to you next time. Bye.